Welcome to part three of the three-part video series in building this machine. Now we're actually going to stick the parts inside of it. So first remove the water filler cover and take out the two Phillips screws. There's two ground wires on the cover. You could remove those if you want to get the cover out of the way. So now get a Sharpie and put labels on the connectors for the switches. This will help you restore the machine um, back to factory. If you want to take all this out at some point in the future, you'll be able to get it back. A bunch of these are going to get unplugged. All right, so first unplug SA and SB because what you're going to do is connect those to the output of the SSR. You need to use 18 gauge or thicker wire, which means thicker means a lower number. So a number 18 gauge or smaller number. Use your crimp tool. Now the particular terminals I had have insulation shields around them. And I used a flush cutter to cut slits in it so that it could still push over the factory insulators. I put ferrules on the ends of this. If you don't have ferrules, you could just clamp down the wires or you could use terminals. You can't use the normal push terminals. You'd have to use the U-shaped ones or circular ones. This will allow the microcontroller to send high voltage out of the SSR into the heating element. Now you're going to want to insulate those screws and you could wrap electrical tape around it or you could have a cover over it. Some of these SSRs come with covers, some of them don't. But I'm actually taking shrink wrap that's normally used for 18650 battery cells and I took a large piece of it and just put it over everything. And then I'm just going to tuck this in there. Um, other people will want to screw the SSR onto the back of the enclosure, but it's a lot easier on the original Classic machine than the Classic Pro. So now we're going to build this T connector. This can be tricky because this hose is very stiff and some of these barb connectors are larger diameter than others and it's hard to get on. Right now, like that's a pretty easy one, but the quarter inch one on the pressure sensor connector was difficult. And you could soak the hose in boiling water or use a heat gun if you want to make it stretch easier. So I'm using these really good hose clamps. It looks like I'm using a nine millimeter for this smaller barb and it just barely fits. Use the tightest one that will fit. You may be able to just use hardware store hose clamps, but I personally would never use those and I can't say how well they'll work. I just don't like them. So for this other end, I'm using a larger one. Looks like 10.5 millimeters. But you have to just test it and see which one fits the most snug while still going on. So I used a microwave and boiled some water in a teacup. And it's very hot, so I had to wear gloves. But then I could force it on. And you're going to want about 20 centimeters of hose. Now, don't just screw everything together because... 
you're going to have to bleed the water through. If there's air in it, the pressure sensor won't work properly. So don't skip ahead and, and cut that out. So now this one that's labeled S4, we have to move it over one. And we're going to take what was underneath it and label it S5. I'm going to remove the steam knob and spout. It's a necessary step if you want to take out the boiler. And you really should take out the boiler. It's a lot easier to access the thermostat and replace it with the temperature sensor. It's quite easy to take the steam wand off. You just need a wrench. It pops right off. Now there's four Allen head screws. You just take those out and the boiler will lift out. Be careful where you cut the hose because it's easy to have it form kinks if you don't cut it in the right spot. Go fairly low. Not crazy low because then it will be hard to get on the barb, but at least as low as I went. And now there's a thermostat on the side. You want to pull the terminals off it and then just unscrew it. And there's some white paste. Don't wipe that off. So that's thermal paste and it helps the heat go across to the sensor. And there's usually enough in there that you don't have to add more. But now you want to take the temperature sensor and screw it in by hand. And only make it finger tight. Do do not use a wrench for that. Just as tight as you can go with your finger. And then put the barb on. Use the boiling water trick again. Make sure that you put the hose clamp on the hose before you do this so that it's already in place and you could clamp it down. For this, I'm back to using a 9mm. For people who buy kits from me, you don't get these hose clamps because it needs a $20 tool, and I don't want to force everyone to have to use this kind of hose clamp because there's a lot of different types of hose clamps, some of which work with the regular screwdriver. But this is a, a very secure kind that is good for real products. I had taken off this pump discharge tube. I'm just putting it back on now. Now you want to make a short jumper, and it's for high voltage and high current, so you need 18 gauge or thicker. And what you're going to do is simply jump the two wires that were previously on the thermostat on the side of the boiler. So now we want to connect the power and bleed some water through the pressure connector. And we do that by simply flicking the uh, brew switch on. Now you have to use a really good thread sealer. And I like Loctite 55. It'll seal even poorly fit loose threads. And it's rated for everything, even gas, even natural gas and propane. It's extremely good. And I include this in the build kit, about a two-foot section of it. Because to buy like um, a package of that is $16, but you only need a little bit. So now you want to tighten this as much as you can. You need two wrenches to do that. By the way, Loctite 565 is also good. And in an emergency, you could just use epoxy or JB weld. 
But of course, you'll never get it apart if you do that. I don't think it would ever leak, though. See, the real issue is the pressure sensor has straight threads that's meant to seal with an O-ring. And the fitting that it goes into is a tapered thread. And they normally don't seal together. So we have the O-ring, but it's not always a perfect fit. So I really recommend using only the very, very best thread sealer, which does not mean Teflon tape. I do not think that's good enough. Now we could hook the pressure sensor up. Now we're plugging in switches. So this black one goes into these two bottom ones and they're connected, they're jumped together. You have to, to read the labels and actually trace what it is. So these black ones are ground on the PCB, but they're actually on the yellow JST. So you can't go by the color, you have to go by the label. And now we're hooking up S for steam and B for brew. The middle switch is brew and the last one is steam. And that's going to the three-way solenoid, which is the last terminal on the high voltage part of the PCB. And what that does is it opens the solenoid, which is normally done when brewing. And that's high voltage, so make sure you wrap tape around it. You don't want that to touch the side of the enclosure because it will short out and throw a breaker if you're lucky. All right, so for high voltage, always use the 18 gauge or thicker wire. So this neutral one, there's a bunch of places you could hook that up to, but I'm just hooking them up to the power switch and load. So for High voltage AC, mains voltage, black means load, and white means neutral. Neutral is usually connected to ground in your breaker panel. So for the one position down, there's a white and a black side. I'm connecting it there. You could see where it is. And I had to use piggyback connectors because you have to leave the original connection in place. Now you could put the top back and that's all done. You could freeze frame this and see what I did. And now there's a P connector on the PCB. We got to get that to the pump. You could see I'm bleeding because the enclosure has some sharp sheet metal. If you don't have a magnetized screwdriver and but you have a magnet, you could rub it on the screwdriver and magnetize it. You need a long Phillips, and the magnet's really important, or else it's hard to lower the screw into the hole. I suppose you could do some kind of glue and make the screw stick to the screwdriver. If you don't have glue, maybe toothpaste would make it stick. So what we did was we took the gray wire off the pump and we put 
that new jumper onto it so that it can turn the pump on. You don't have to cut a hole to run an LCD to the front. You could just feed it through the steam wand hole that's already in the enclosure. Now we're plugging the SSR control wires into the PCB. So if you get this printed LCD frame from me, it comes with support material on it that helps it print, helps the overhangs be supported when it prints. You have to pull that off with the pliers. But also note that there's like a thin layer that you also have to peel off. It's called an interface layer. And it may not be obvious, but it's there. And if you don't take that off, the magnets won't be recessed enough. So take a look for that. And you could see what I'm doing. Use a, a, a small flathead screwdriver and you could dig into it and peel that off. I'm using epoxy. I tried hot glue once with this and it really didn't hold well enough. If you have some gel super glue, I think that will work. But I happen to have epoxy and it's probably the best. It may say it cures in five minutes or an hour, but I would leave it overnight. It's really not maximum strength quickly. You need a spacer behind the LCD so that when you do the touch screen, it doesn't press in. So this worked on the first try. Make sure when you start it up you get a build number and that means that the main software is actually communicating with the touchscreen because the display code runs on the touchscreen separately. Notice how I have the PCB in a different position. It has to clear that water funnel. And it's a really good idea to have the ST-Link on the back of the machine so you could update the software without opening it up. So I ran the wires through the vent hole and have it on the back of the machine. I even hot glued the wires in place so that they can't pull out by accident. So I'm trying this for the first time and I don't really have enough coffee grounds in there and the grind is a little coarse so it runs a little faster than it should but I'm not trying to optimize it now I'm just verifying that the machine works. It's important that you see the pressure readout do something because that proves the pressure sensor is working. As far as things like the weight that can all be calibrated using a preference. And I haven't configured any of that, so don't expect this to brew like the perfect cup of coffee because I'm only testing if this works at all. Also notice the LCD is a little crooked, but since it's a magnet, you can just rotate that easily. So it all seems to be working great. Pretty quiet too. My other one's a lot louder. You can see the three way valve is working.
if the temperature is not rising quickly enough, you could go into settings and there's something called hardware power and it defaults to a value of 500. Try lowering it to 200 and that will send more power to the heating element. When it's ready, it will say so. We're at 12 bar of pressure. You can see the pressure drop when the steam comes out. So that works perfectly. So all functions are working. Notice the drip tray is white. That's because I haven't peeled off the factory plastic. This is a new machine and I haven't peeled the plastic off the drip tray or the top. So I hope that helps.